Howdy folks, welcome back. It's Lisa here at Everything is a Lie. Um, today I just wanted to have a fairly quick, although knowing me it'll drag on, look at Cottesloe Beach. So we've looked a lot around Fremantle, East Fremantle, we've looked a bit at Perth, we found a castle out in Mount Lawley. There's lots more as you can see by all these stars but I'm trying to build up an overall picture and I will give you a shortened version so that we can sort of cut to the chase a bit further down the track. But today Cottesloe, so Cottesloe the suburb, I just want to look at the beachfront kind of area and see what turns up there, uh, any buried windows etc. Uh, old buildings, interesting tales. Um, a reminder for anyone that's just tuned in if they don't know what I'm talking about when I refer to mud flood, buried windows, um, reset, any of that, please look at the playlists. I put them there for you so help explain what I'm talking about. Meanwhile, I'm just going to continue looking at physical evidence and some of the odd stories that associate. So today, Cottesloe, we'll look at the Ocean Beach Hotel and a couple of very nice houses that will give you some real estate envy and a little bit of house porn there. Um, on with it. Wake up and listen. Okay, Cottesloe, Western Australia, suburb of Perth, uh, named for Thomas Fremantle, first Baron of Cottesloe, a Tory politician, brother of Admiral Sir Charles Fremant Fremantle, uh, was home to one of our Prime Ministers, John Curtin. You'll see his head pop up later. Uh, beachside suburb, I think you saw that already. Founded by the Vlaming Memorial, so that being, come on, ah, here we go, uh, Dutch sea captain, but mission proved fruitless, nothing here, nothing to see. A uh, large part of Cottesloe is residential, although a significant shopping area is located along Stirling Highway. We won't go to the Stirling Highway side, we'll stay down near the beach today. Uh, statistics. Uh, this one looks fascinating but is much uh, more recent, 1939 I think they put on that um, and I couldn't find any evidence of it being much older. I'll go to the app, I found an app, it's a much more interesting way to look at things than uh, Wikipedia and just the Heritage Council etc. So the app has to say, in the early days of the Swan River Colony, the Cottesloe area was sparsely settled. At this time, settlement in the area comprised mainly of lime burners, quarrymen and goat herders. In the 1850s, convict labour commenced the construction of the Perth to Fremantle Road, now Stirling Highway, and the Perth to Fremantle Railway was completed in 1881. Stations were constructed at Cottesloe and Cottesloe Beach, which is now Mosman Park making the area more accessible. The area was named Cottesloe in 1886 and became a roads board district in 1895. So that's kind of like the precursor to um, local councils. Initially a popular seaside retreat, the area did not become developed as a predominantly residential suburb until after the gold rushes of the early 1890s. In contrast to the increasing population and overcrowding of the city, the area became valued for the healthy sea breezes and close proximity to the Indian Ocean and the Swan River. Grand summer houses and rental properties together with modest residential homes were constructed, giving the area an eclectic mix of design styles. 
Okay, starting off today with the Ocean Beach Hotel. This building was once a Grand Federation filigree style hotel built in 1907 and designed by Louis Bowser Cumpston. It is situated in North Cottesloe on the corner of Eric Street and Marine Parade. The OBH, as it is often called, opened on the 3rd of January in 1908. It was part of life in the district since then and remains a meeting point for country families down through the generations. Sadly, the place has been altered beyond all re recognition when the frontage was remodelled by W.G. Bennett in 1936. His name will come up again uh, at some point in the future. We'll look at quickly Mr. Cumpston's other works just to get an idea of his flavour. Louis Bowser Cumpston, born in 1865 in Liverpool in England. At 12 years of age, he arrived with two sisters and a brother to join his father in Victoria. He studied at the grammar school in Echuca, where his father, an accountant, declared insolvency for the second time. It seems to be that he didn't have a very easy life and there's a few trials and tribulations. I won't go into them. The early 1890s were considered disastrous times economically in Melbourne and there was little work. Consequently, many young people were forced to move to more prosperous locations. In 1891, at 25 years of age, Cumpston sailed for Perth, where he gradually established himself in business as an architect. I think that's all we need to know there. It might be important to note that Mr Cumpston seems to have been the only person I've discovered so far that has had two buildings moved. So this is directly behind the GPO, which I covered earlier. Uh, no mention of below ground floors, but they basically, they kept the facade of the building, the original building, and stored it away while they built the new, there's the GPO, built the new um, underground railway underneath it. And then they have um, rebuilt it. So this building here is definitely um, got windows right at ground level here and is now rebuilt to look like this. So they've remade the facade back to original style. But the um, State Heritage site says the pairing of Ionic engaged columns around the central bays creates an interesting rhythm. The composition of the facade suggests that the proposed development may originally have been intended to be larger than what was origin eventually built. So, and then the other building is torn down and moved to accommodate the new Elizabeth Key development and rebuilt entirely brick by brick as well. So maybe he just had bad luck. So this is what it looks like and I probably wouldn't have even bothered if I hadn't passed by and noticed these chimneys on the top. So she's still in there. Such a giveaway these chimneys. Hmm. Look at what they've done to it. It's a crying shame if you ask me. So moving on to the Cottesloe Beach Hotel. Fear not, this is not going to turn into a pub crawl, but this is where we're starting at that end of town. Um, oh, hello. Again, I kind of went, meh, it's Art Deco, meh, don't worry about it. Not the kind of place we're looking for. Then the chimneys made me question and sure enough there's historical details we need to see. Being a pub, uh, virtually every pub in Australia was built with a cellar. So are they mud flood? Uh, what came first, the pub or the mud flood? I don't know. Built in 1904, it has been claimed as a Charles Lancelot Oldham design and was owned by Mrs. Alice McSwan, who is said to have had several land holdings in the area. In 1913, 
Thomas Malloy bought the hotel and undertook the 1936 refurbishment as designed by Hobbs, Forbes and Partners. Hobbs again. The style was considered continental modern, which relies for effect on plain surfaces with concealed neon lighting in red, green and blue. The work took three months and involved refacing the street elevation, provision of lounges, reconstruction of bars and extensions comprising 27 bedrooms, a kitchen block and garages, etc. Now only the Art Deco facade, fireplaces and some original architraves remain. There have been several renovations and a few name changes from Cottesloe Beach Hotel to Hotel Cottesloe, Cottesloe Beach Resort and now returning to Cottesloe Beach Hotel in 1993 but always colloquially known as the Cot. The State Heritage Site notes that the 1930s was an important period of social activity and emergence of the seaside holiday tradition in Cottesloe and that the hotel is one of the last remaining 1930s structures on the foreshore. 1930s, pish. So this then answers my question of whether I need to be looking into the numerous Art Deco style buildings around Perth as well. They've all been covered up. Let's look at Thomas Malloy. Okay, so let's just get the skinny on this guy. Thomas George Anstruther Malloy. 1852 to 1938, born Toronto, Canada, son of soldier John Malloy, who migrated to join the Pensioner Guard in Western Australia. He attended Christian Brothers College until the age of 13. He worked at a cooperative, then later managed the city store. He buys an entire block of prime city land between Murray and Wellington Streets. He owned and ran a bakery along with staff cottages. By 1881, he's working for the Daily News. He marries Amelia Littlejohn and has six children. In 1884, he becomes commercial manager for the West Australian newspaper. He buys land and hotels from the estate of James Grave. The sources don't agree on that. April 1888, wife Amelia dies at age 35. Malloy remarries within nine months to Mary Reaney and has two more children. He becomes a city rates clerk and council representative, appointed justice of the peace, wins a seat in the legis legislative assembly, serves one term. He builds a theatre royal. He buys land in the city and is granted a liquor licence within a week. He builds the Metropole Hotel in the next year. He builds His Majesty's Theatre and His Majesty's Hotel, 1902-04. Malloy went on to build other hotels such as the Australia Hotel in Perth, the North Beach Hotel, the Brighton Hotel in Scarborough and the Oceanic, later Mosman Park Hotel. Malloy is described as litigious and occasionally would resort to violence. He became rather mean and a negligent landlord Buildings of his in St George's Terrace degenerated into slums. In 1931, he is created a papal knight commander of the Order of St Gregory the Great. He went by the title of Sir from that point on. Malloy died in 1938 and was survived by one daughter. Sorry, I think he said he, I, he had six children in the first marriage. It was only three. And I forgot to mention he also served two one-year terms as mayor of Perth where his municipal socialism was seen as radical, particularly in matters of gas and water supply, transport and sewerage. He was also on the board, the original board of trustees for the Karakata Cemetery, which first opened in 1899 and he served there for 40 years in all. Busy, busy man. Moving on. So the plan was after looking at the hotels to look at the Cottesloe Civic Centre but it is such a massive can of worms that I don't think I can do it justice by squeezing it in between everything else um, and it's already looking like there's going to be a part two so um, I will talk about it in part two 
It has huge grounds. It has former Prime Minister Curtin's head on a stick. Um, it's got symbology going on, globes, crosses. We've got, again, mining magnates and Supreme Court justices. So this is the building. This is now gone all the grounds around it. I will come back to it and give you um, a bit more information because when you look at well, what was there before, uh, very different to what it is now. So sorry to leave you hanging, but we'll look at that on another time. Moving on to John Street. Number 42 John Street, Cottesloe, Pine Lodge. 42 John Street is an important house of historic and architectural interest. It was owned by William Zempel, who was a local councillor. He also owned a permanent well, which he used to water the sapling Norfolk pine trees, which are abundant throughout the area. Edwin, Edwin Summerhays, the architect of Pine Lodge, arrived in WA Western Australia, in 1894, going straight to Coolgardie, returning to Perth a few years later. He was a foundation member of the Western Australian Institute of Architects. The home is an elegant Victorian Queen Anne bungalow of tuck-pointed brick, red brick, with an iron roof, sheltered by wide verandas with large turned posts and regular square section frieze. It has a belvedere to the southwest corner with pressed zinc cladding and a candle snuffer roof. The front sitting room was a bay window with casement windows. The main bedroom and dining room have bay windows with double hung floor to ceiling windows and doors with side windows. The front door contains an exquisite original leaded stained glass of a country scene. Just looking at Tukarua in the Heritage Council of Western Australia website. I won't go through too much of the detail. The house at 7 Rosendo Street, Cottesloe, known as Tukarua, is a large two-storey residence set in extensive grounds. It was constructed in 1896 as a summer beach residence for the Honourable Septimus Burt King's Council and his family. Septimus Burt, son of the first Je Chief Justice of the colony, Archibald Burt, was a prominent figure in Western Australia in the late 19th century, a barrister of, in the law firm of Stone and Burt and the first silk awarded in the colony. He was also active in public life. I won't dwell too much on that. But I did want to just look briefly at the, um, the story. It's a quite an interesting story. So Septimus Burt died in 1919 and the house continued to be used as a summer residence until his son, Archibald Burt, rented the house to a Mr and Mrs Cass in 1933. Mrs Cass used the house as a boarding house. The venture was profitable and in 1939 Mr and Mrs Cass purchased the property. Shortly afterward, during the Second World War, the house was used to house refugees from Singapore as part of the war effort. To accommodate the additional people, the house was divided into private apartments with framed walls and bathrooms and kitchens installed. After the war, the, the partitioning was not removed, but Mrs Cass did not take in further boarders. Upon her death, Tukarua passed to her daughter, Miss Dorothea Maud Cass, the current owner. A condition of inheritance was that Miss Cass did not marry and that the house was not altered in any way. This has ensured the retention of all the original features of the house, albeit in some disrepair, apparently huge disrepair. Miss Cass lived in the front part of the house until 1993 when she was moved to a nursing home. The house is currently occupied by Mr Ted Smith, a friend of Miss Cass, who has lived in the rear of the house for some time, um, apparently 30 or 40 years, is covered in the Today Tonight video. I won't go on any further. This was obviously written 
before the renovations, etc. So he has gone on to renovate the house. I think he spent $5 million over six years to renovate it and we'll have a look at what it looks like now. So Septimus, son of Archibald, uh, born in the West Indies, arrived in 1861, uh, would have been 14, attended Hale School, served as an articled clerk to George Frederick Stone and was admitted to the bar in 1870, 1876, went into partnership. So that was Stone and Burt, offered a knighthood, declined it several invitations to join the bench of the Supreme Court, which he also declined. Um, I'll skip all the details. Married Louisa Fanny Hare and had 10 children. He was a synodsman. Now, I had to look that up. A synodsman, see sidesman. Ecclesiastic law, a church officer who originally reported to the bishop on clerical and congregational misdeeds, including heretical acts. Bert was captain of the Perth Cricketeers and foundation member of the World Club. The World Club is a gentleman's club in Perth, Western Australia, founded in 1871 by members of the establishment of Perth and we'll look at the building in another video because um, it's still standing, it's beautiful um, and it's in the middle of Perth city. Okay so that's Septimus. I must have missed this elsewhere. I just noticed that this site says designed by RT McMasters as a single story building and built by Bunnings Brothers. They'll come up again. In 1896 it was altered soon after in 1897 by J Talbot Hobbs uh, in 1901 Hobbs designed a second story for the house Hobbs names uh, name will come up a lot as well so there it is and the main thing I wanted to draw attention to was there's a doorway here that goes through there's another doorway inside there and there is a low basement but it doesn't say much about it and she is built into a slope. But it's now passed from power brokers through a very strange family story to more power brokers and currently or most recently has been housing Syrian refugees. I did just want to go over these images again. Um, and of course now the power broker has another plan for it but it should remain much the same it's a beautiful shot of the staircase uh, new buildings to be constructed swimming pool etc uh, and there was quite some controversy the sale was subject to a dispute with the former owner Ted Smith who claimed he was only giving thir given 30 minutes to consider a rush deal offered at a sum well, well under the sale price. Magic view, hot in the afternoons in summer though. Went on the market in July 2014 at a potential price of 50 million. Tell him he's great. Mr Smith who'd lived in the mansion for 43 years dropped 20 million off the price in November. He struck a deal with Mr Forrest in June 2015 and later apologised for suggesting that the mining magnate had improp <laughs> acted improperly. Just a bit of an insight into Andrew Forrest in case you're wondering who he is in Australia. Uh, he's one of our richest people and he compares in Australian terms to this crowd apparently. And there he is. Wonderful person, does wonderful, wonderful things. Moving on, Le Fanu. Okay, 
so this must have been during the construction. Lots of security cameras I noticed. Come on Google, catch up. Oh, we're here. This was also during the construction. Hello, Thomas McGlynn is my name, National Head of Sales for the agency. And on behalf of Pamela Wilkinson and the entire Western Australian team, we are delighted to bring you one of Perth's, if not Australia's, finest heritage restoration homes. Welcome to La Fanu. Nestled into the dunes at the bottom of Salvado Street is Banksia, built by Henry Diggins Homes and his wife Marion in 1893. Mr Holmes was a member of the Cottesloe Roads Board from 1895 to 1897 and was general manager of the First West Australian Bank. Mrs Holmes became a leading charity worker and artist in Western Australia and was an active foundation, foundation member along with Dame Edith Cowan and a regular Freemason of the First Women's Club in Australia. The Karakata Club was established in 1894 for mutual improvement and social intercourse. The Holmes family had a significant effect upon the culture of Western Australia through banking and charitable activities. The unidentified architect of Banksia was the same as for the Ministering Children's League Hostel, now known as WEN, coming up, which the Holmes family set up. In 1898 and 1900, substantial additions and alterations designed by the architect Percy William Harrison were undertaken. Harrison was prominent in the Freemasons, holding high honours in the Masonic world as Senior Grand Warden and Master of the Mundaring Lodge. The property was eventually sold in 1945 to Perth Diocesan Trustees and renamed after the then Archbishop of Perth, Henry Fruin Le Fanu. Its social significance continued through the period of ownership by the Church of England under the guidance of Bishop Le Fanu, who continued the charitable works established by the Holmes family. Le Fanu fell into ruin in the late 20th century after returning to private ownership and became the subject of controversy after the owner was taken to court for contravention of a conservation order. The house is a rambling split-level Queen Anne-style home now with five bedrooms, formerly eight a ballroom and a dining room which can seat 40 people and is situated on almost 1,500 square metres of land with a 36 metre ocean frontage. The walls are coarse rubble limestone with brick coining around the Romanesque arch windows, doors and air vents. It has an iron roof which at one time had been replaced with asbestos sheeting the windows are placed to take advantage of the ocean views from three sides. The southern facade is the most dominant with the candle snuffer roofed hexagonal bay with arched windows to the southeast. The eaves have decorative corbelling. The roof is topped with an elaborate cast metal finial. A dominant gable thrusting forward to enclose arched windows is supported on a decorative masonry corbels and turn supports. The verandas are supported on simple square posts. The chimney stacks are stuccoed with an elaborate frieze and double corbel. The front door is solid wood with lights on either side and above. The home was sold again in 2009 for a greatly reduced sum of 4.25 million and later underwent an 11 million dollar renovation. Perth's most expensive that took 18 months to complete. The renovation included new bathrooms and toilets as there were none previously and the kitchen had to be taken down and reconstructed to accommodate the new driveway into the basement level car park. The grandeur continues below with a wine cellar, tasting room, a large laundry, extensive storage, a spectacular 10-car garage complete with marble flooring and its own resident ghost. 
It's currently anticipated to be worth around $17 million, expressions of interest are sought. Is anyone interested? I'm certainly interested. PayPal me, folks. So looking at that, um, I'm seeing definitely some kind of buried windows, etc. The cellar, the fact that there's a ghost in there is interesting. Um, the cellar is massive. Obviously, they've extended it um, to fit nine cars in and all that storage. And the fact that the architect is unknown is interesting too. That's even from the State Heritage Site that the architect is unknown. So the unknown architect is also the same architect that is responsible for WAN, which we'll look at now, which is just down the road a tiny bit more from Le Fanu. House Envy, House Envy. Moving on. Oh, who's having Garage Envy? The Wern Hostel, formerly known as the Ministering Children's League, was a worldwide organisation founded by the Countess of Meath in England. The original concept was based on a popular book published in 1854 which encouraged children to care for those in need. The MCL was non-sectarian and included adult and child members in the belief that children should do good deeds on behalf of those less fortunate. In 1891, the Cottesloe branch of the League was inaugurated by Mrs. Marion Holmes and land was subsequently granted by the government for the erection of the home opposite the beach on the corner of Wharton Street. It is now named the Wern Hostel. It has strong historic associations with many eminent West Australians principally Anglicans who gave their support to the place, including Walter Padbury, the Holmes family, Lady Onslow, architect P.W. Harrison, Dame Edith Cowan, Lady Mitchell, John Tonkin, and the wives of all the governors of Western Australia in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, particularly Lady Lawley. The original Ministering Children's League convalescent home was built in 1897. The first stage of the convalescent home was the male ward. It stood on the corner of Wharton Street and Swanbourne Terrace, which is now Marine Parade, and provided care for those recovering from serious illnesses such as typhoid fever. Subsequent additions for women's patients were made in 1901, and in 1909 the two-storey Meath Wing facing the ocean was added. Various other minor utilita utilitarian additions and structures such as the kitchen building and toilet blocks have since been added. It is a sprawling single and two-storey interconnecting collection of buildings which have been sympathetically restored to conform to a Federation Queen Anne style. The gables are half timbered the corner tower has round windows in its facets with decorative mouldings. Unfortunately, the original witch's hat on the tower has been replaced by a less imposing and squat roof. The stone and iron roof buildings have attractive wooden verandas with the lances and crossed beams. Some verandas have been enclosed over time. Brick string courses contrast with the stone blocks which are either smooth faced or pillow and of various sizes and shapes, adding texture and interest to the building. The water supply was laid throughout the building from a well worked by a windmill and drainage conducted by earthenware, earthenware pipes. There is also extensive cellarage under the main building. A nod's as good as a wink to a blind man there, folks. And now, with that really awkward segue, we move on to the top of the hill to the Deaf Institute. That's an institute for deaf people, not an actual deaf institute. Our last port of call for the day.
The Western Australian Institute for Deaf Education is located on Curtin Avenue near Wharton Street. It was originally named the Western Australian Deaf and Dumb Institute, established in 1896 in East Perth by William Thompson and Company. The foundation stone for the Cottesloe building was laid in accordance with Masonic rites by Sir Gerard Smith, the Governor of Western Australia, on the 2nd of November 1899. The Institute formally moved to the Cottesloe location in 1900. The different building phases of the main building were designed by three prominent Western Australian architectural firms. Wilkinson and Smith in 1899, Hobbs, Smith and Forbes from 1905 to 1909, that's J. Talbot Hobbs as previously mentioned, and Eels, Cohen and Bennett in 1935, with later additions designed by the Public Works Department. Situated on almost two hectares of prime elevated land, it is constructed in the Federation Queen Anne style. The Institute was a residential school for children who were deaf and or mute and was run by a private committee. The school relied heavily on donations and fundraising for its early years until the government took over administration in 1949. It admitted children of all ages, including wards of the state and private boarders. It was one of a number of educational, health and welfare facilities established in the late 19th century by private individuals and supported by philanthropic committees. Okay, so it's probably important that we have a look at what else has been attributed to Wilkin and Smith architects. I've found a few of the buildings um, still standing. I've got this one in Fremantle. Um, definitely the style of architecture and the age that we're looking at. I'm not sure if I've covered this building before. I don't know if that has a basement, but there, this is the section... A Fremantle that's been completely re-leveled. Uh, this one also in Fremantle, it's only a block away from the Fremantle building I just showed you. This one's missing its uh, witch's hat. There's a very similar building that was in Perth is almost identical but it has a big witch's hat. Um, this one is a hotel so I'd say 99% it's got a basement. Uh, this one I covered briefly uh, in my Fremantle video. Uh, you've got all the correct architecture going on and it's definitely if there's not now there was another level and there's um, lower build um, sorry lower windows at the back whoops don't want to do that. This building here definitely has a basement and so does this one over here. This one, the world of renovation. So um, we're looking at a definite basement on this one as well. Uh, their website has got lots of detail there. So they've got up to the first level and a basement level underneath. Beautiful building, that one. Obviously a good advertisement for them. This one in Adelaide Terrace in Perth City, this was the former um, girls' orphanage. Same era, same style, same chimneys. Um... Couldn't tell you what's under that, but it's an orphanage. I bet it's haunted too. It's now the Department of Housing, I believe. And this one, I managed to find this one in Northbridge, um, which has got a floor half below road level. Um, it also has a magnificent chimney. I'll just pop around the side there. Why are you so slow? Oh. Okay. Yeah, 
So we've got the chimneys again, we've got the curved head windows of the same shape and size and there's another floor down there. Possibly another one below that, who knows. Let's look at Mr Thompson. Mr William Richard Thompson arrived from Melbourne, Victoria early in 1896, meeting with other deaf people and discovering that there was no school for deaf children in Western Australia. A former pupil of the Donaldson Hospital in Edinburgh, Thompson had been in Melbourne and Adelaide for around six years before coming west. He persuaded his sister, Eleanor Thompson, a teacher at the Victorian School for Deaf Children, to come to Perth and teach here. She and her colleague from the same school, Henry Witchell, soon set off for Perth. Witchell as superintendent and Miss Thompson as matron began teaching three deaf girls in a private house by September 1896. After moving to Cottesloe, Henry and Eleanor married in 1903 and continued to run the institute until Henry's death in 1926. The major problem with the story is that they were apparently teaching the American version of sign language, which is one-handed spelling and it is different to the rest of Australia. So I looked for some more resources to confirm this story and I looked some more and there are virtually no other resources online in our deaf history anywhere that mention Thompson at all. It's funny, I would have thought to have found a lot more about him. So the Find and Connect site, this is a really interesting site if you're looking at uh, orphanages, children homes etc. I just wanted to point out before we look at the photos that they note 2004 signpost their publication the only details about the number of children resident at the facility are drawn from the annual reports of the child welfare department for the certain years between 1935 and 1968 so these are just the residential children not the uh, children um, being taught on a daily day-to-day -day basis 1935 two children 1936 three children 1942 two children two children one child two children one child four children so the dormitories would have been virtually empty that would have been more unsettling as a deaf child having a whole dormitory to yourself take a bit of an in-depth look at the building. So this is the um, Wern facility that we looked at just previously. Uh, Marine Parade, Wharton, Curtain Ave and I can't remember the name of that one. We'll see that in a minute. So I'm looking at the chimneys, I'm looking at the brickwork, I'm looking at the style of the building this was added later, this was definitely added later, some of this was added later. This is the wing that they're saying was not built until 1935 but we'll take a closer look. So I've got mixed feelings about this photograph. Um, So there's a tree in in front of this section between the veranda and the, the front of the building there. Hmm. I don't know, it could all be perfectly legitimate, uh, but it looks like there's some sort of spire or something there, I'm not sure what that is. That's something hanging out of the tree, I don't know. Um, some random wires hanging around as well. Not sure what that's about. Can't really tell a lot. Most of the photos of um, that we'll look at of people in front of the building only show this small section of it. So it doesn't really help.
the stuff. Let's. So this is Miss Eleanor Thompson here. Mr. Witchell. Read that, and, and that's not going to help. It looks like it could be Mr. Witchell. This photo, this is one that really made me actually question when I first looked at this. Um, again, you've got your your Nilla sky, but yeah, okay, maybe it was a cloudy day. Is very neatly cut here. So they've perfectly lined up the veranda post and the side of the building and I wasn't sure if that was possible or not so I had to drive back there and have another go myself um, and it can be done. It's not at a natural ground level either to take it but it does to me look like there's something missing here. Um... 1901, Mr. Witchell and Miss, Mrs. Thomas, Miss Thompson. Uh, 190, I can't read that. It's got to be after three because that's when they were married. Uh, teaching. Mrs. Witchell again. Doesn't look quite like the same lady. Not Mr. Witchell. That's a uh... I don't know, that one looks a bit funny to me. Is that a hat? I can't read that. Does this say millinery class? And that doesn't help. Sorry, folks. Mrs. Witchell's cooking class in 1904. If that's Mrs. Witchell there, she's gone blonde or grey at an early age. Very suddenly, might have had a fright. Uh, woodworking, school group, dressmaking, here out the front on the steps. So you can't see anything beyond the original portion of the building anyway uh, and this is on the northern side so looking the other way towards Mosman Park nineteen twelve not sure if that's anything there where the other section of the building is added Boys dormitory, sick room, physical education, can't see anything there either. Don't know. And then later photos. Again, same section of the building in 1921, no view of the other side very neatly cut off. Mm. Snell, so this is later, 28, 28, after uh, Mr. and Mrs. Witchell ceased to be part of the organisation. So Again, same part of the building. Don't know. 
Boom, I've got it. I must have been really tired when I first looked at these photos. 1900, look at the trees. 1912, look at the trees. Okay, there could be different trees. But 1912, 1912, 1912. So the trees have doubled in size during the year 1912. Also, shadows this way, shadows this way. I'm not sure about this shadow over here in this tree that doesn't appear in any of the other photos. Veranda comes to the edge of the building, down pipe. Veranda comes to the edge of the building, down pipe. Veranda doesn't come to the edge of the building. Nor here, it's stepped back. There's no garden in there by the look of it there. There's a garden planted there. So it would be logical for the sun to be coming from this direction here or that way. It can't be coming from both. Somebody's been messing with the photos. Okay, so this is just a wonderful image. Same person that took the picture of the roundhouse that I love so much too, Di Champ. And look, very recent. Most helpful, Di, thank you so much. So this has all been, uh, they've put a much larger temporary fence and I really didn't want to go in there and get myself in strife and I did do a bit of a walk around. Uh, the back is all closed off and from the other side I had to, I walked through between the newer building that's on the side here um, and had to climb the fence to get out. But I think there's a squatter living in there at the moment. So it's empty. It's been empty for some time. Um, looking at the construction. So the chimneys are, I find, the biggest giveaway. When looking at um, these mud flooded houses or houses of that period, the, the chimneys are the greatest giveaway because they just doesn't exist in the modern era such lovely ornate chimneys. Um, and it's not something that uh, open fires aren't used a lot anymore and you know when people are using them because the air quality suffers dramatically. So looking at the two um, different sections I they are different uh, this one you'll see has corbel brickwork I'll hopefully find a better shot of that for you there's an extra uh, row of corbelled brickwork at the top before the gable and on this side you've got the white stripe instead so they are different errors but then the chimneys match chimneys chimneys um, the window style etc but then you've got these small windows on this side and the other side which I'll get to in a minute here we can see maybe maybe we can see um, there's a little trap door under here which I wasn't brave enough to go poking into um, so I don't know what is under here but it's all been closed in and I did notice these bricks and these bricks are of a different era this is also just the standard what's it called stretcher bond pattern whereas this is either the is that the Flemish bond brick laying pattern on there there is the corbel and that's just got the the white stripe so I don't know if the stripes were added later. Um, the veranda was probably added later. What else can we see from these images? There's quite a step up here. Um, these, this bit was added later, but to match the same height. Um, and these are quite short garage doors. Uh, this is all added later. 
potentially this. We'll have a look at the other side in a second. This building had me curious. Some of the original building back here is painted uh, cream or white or whatever it is. This has long windows that don't really match the other windows and a long window on this side, um, the west facing side. To me this looked a bit more like a mud flooded building and then you've got um, like there could have been more of it or it may have been a chapel of some sort or it's a very strange little outbuilding. There's a retaining wall in here um, and that's a good couple of feet difference up to the, there are level changes all over the place so. Uh, what else do we need to look at? I'll look at the other side. Oh, this is a better view of the roof. So, original, supposedly, original, not sure, that chimney doesn't match, but that looks like it's been added later. Um, and this is the bit that the southern wing that is meant to be added in 1935 but unsure about that there's been lots of bits tacked on it's probably had several re-roofs over the years where is the other side image Gibney Street that was the name I couldn't remember Wait. Gently. okay so Added later, added later. Not sure about this. Wait, this photo is a much better angle, and you can see the little addition tacked on there as well. But then you've got what looks to be an original chimney. So over the years, they list 1900, um, 1905, 1909 is extensions and then it goes on to 1935 when they say they added the south wing. So wrapping up for today, hopefully in under an hour, um, we've seen some interesting characters, some tall tales and some buried stuff, some sad stories and happy stories and a haunting. Um, I hope you're enjoying the content and seeing the bigger picture as well. I certainly am. I'm calling it the attack of the benevolent societies. It would appear they loved us and loved us so much until our fur rubbed off and our eyes had to be replaced by buttons. Coming up in part two, we'll look at the Civic Centre as promised. I also want to have a look at the missing jetty and boardwalk because I think they're relevant to what the town was at some point. Um, and I've also saved the best chimney for last. Um, I will also come back at some point and we'll look at Mr Hobbs, Mr J Talbot Hobbs, because his story is a very interesting one involving some fanciful architecture. Thanks for joining me. Like, comment, subscribe. Bye bye for now.